day welcome to yet another episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel my name is Chris Muir I'm an ADF product manager in today's episode we're finishing off a set of episodes based on ADF architectural patterns so over approximately seven to eight episodes we've considered a number of different patterns or a number of different architectures or designs for creating your composite ADF applications now this final episode today, well, it's a bit of a catch-all because there's a couple of patterns that I'd like to address but don't really require episodes in their own right. So we're going to have a look at them, both of them today, one called the multi-access channel pattern and the second one, which is in fact an anti-pattern called the fine grain pattern to see what we can learn from both of these patterns. So in considering the multi-access channel architecture, one of the things that you'll see in this diagram is we're pretty much using the same diagram, diagram elements as previous. And you can see we have a common workspace, a cylinder workspace made up of business components and banner task flows in the model and view controller projects respectively. And that's published via an ADF library jar and reconsumed by a master workspace, everything published via an unbounded task flow. Now that particular delivery mechanism is well suited to access through a web browser running on a laptop or a desktop application, uh, laptop or desktop I should say, um, ultimately serving HTML over HTTP. Now if we built that application, all good and well, we're servicing the needs of those desktop and laptop type consumers. But we know in today's development world that we have new opportunities coming along. For instance, we have mobile applications where mobile applications may not want all the, um, web, the web constructs that we've created previously, but what they might want to do is access the business services or the ADF business components that our overall main application might have, public, uh, might have uh, built in. So the interesting question is with our entity objects, view objects, application modules, is can we make all those business services accessible to mobile applications or maybe other types of infrastructure such as service oriented architecture solutions, enterprise service buses and so on. Well in fact we can, again this is a feature that not many customers are aware of, but ADF business components can publish view objects and application modules as something called SDO web services. And essentially SDO web services essentially put up on the internet the web services, slope based web services that these external consumers can make use of. Now that's really good from your perspective because that means you start to get double use out of your overall application architecture. Rather than just providing a web based front end, it now means that you can reuse some of that functionality that you've coded at more of the business service level, the model layer or the ADF business components layer. You can make reuse of that in your external types uh, services or external, external type devices such as mobile applications and so on and so forth. So an interesting question at this point then is, well, can we just take all the application modules, the view objects and entity objects and just publish them as SDO web services? Well, technically only the AMs and the VOs can actually be published as web services. Remember, in particular, the entity objects are exposed through the view objects and that's why we don't expose entity objects as SDO web services as such. So again, to rephrase the question, can we just publish our AMs, our application modules and our VOs, our view objects as web services for mobile applications to make use of? Well, arguably we could, but if you think about the AMs and VOs that you've designed to date, typically they're designed around a web front end. Specifically, if you think about your view objects, say you've created a JSPX or a JSF page with a table, a bunch of columns, pagination, record set fetches, and so on and so forth, you've tuned and modified that view object in order to satisfy that web page. Okay, so your design at this stage has been all around that. Now, if you go and make use of that same view object from a mobile application, well, two things about mobile applications. They do not want to, across the internet or across Wi-Fi or whatever, want to download a lot of information because basically connectivity is an issue for mobile applications. So on the mobile app, if you've only got one column or two columns showing from the particular view object, but the view object in the overall SDO web services provides 20 columns, that's all going to go across the wire to the mobile device. And it's going to make the mobile device run particularly slow as it's waiting to download the information. In addition, you're going to take out more memory on the device. It's going to take more processing time. And you can start to see that those AMs and VOs maybe aren't well suited to publishing as mobile um, applications. Well, let me say again, interfaces for mobile applications. 
But ultimately, it's those entity objects with all their business rules in it, their default value logic, their business rules, their security logic, all that logic that you do want to make re reuse of. So when we consider the multi-access architecture, or the multi-access channel architecture pattern, I should say, what we've got to realize is there's definitely still parts of our application we want to make reuse of. It's a really good idea. But you just can't go and publish all your AMs and your VOs, your application modules and your view objects, and expect the mobile applications to be happy with that. You may have to, with your entity objects, put them back in the common project or the common workspace and then ultimately define view objects and AMs for your web front end and VOs and AMs for your mobile front end. You need to consider the use case. So the multi-access channel pattern is an interesting one because if you consider the previous episodes, we seem to have come a full circle. In the sum of the parts pattern, we were advocating putting the ADF business components, the model project as such, off into its own common workspace. Now in the cylinder and pillar patterns, we kind of reversed that. We said no, put them back into the actual workspaces for each cylinder and pillar as such. Now in the multi-access channel pattern, we're kind of now advocating putting the entity objects, well, back into a common workspace, but then having separate workspaces per access path and providing different AMs and VOs based on their needs. Now I'm pretty sure when I've been talking in all these episodes, I've been very clear that there isn't a one-size-fits-all architectural pattern. You need to consider your use cases, your requirements, and as we can see here, when you have this requirement of an external consumer, such as a mobile application, SOA suite, or an enterprise service bus, you may need to pick a different architectural pattern based on that use case. Putting the multi-access channel pattern aside, we're now going to consider the last pattern, an anti-pattern called the fine grain pattern. As you can see in the diagram, we've actually considered a number of different patterns in order to get to this point. And let me be very clear, this isn't the complete set of patterns. These are just patterns we've observed or patterns we think that suit particular use cases. We hope to give you some idea of the patterns you can pick yourself. But there are also other patterns out there that in fact that I've had discussions with various consultants and other Oracle staff members that they've made use of. But in the end, there are a number of different patterns where your goal is to pick the right pattern for your use case, your requirements, your team skills, and your infrastructure. So let's now consider the fine grain pattern, an anti-pattern. So over the previous episodes, we've been talking about the term patterns, and obviously patterns are a way for different developers to share proven best practices, in our case of ADF architecture patterns or designs. Now, an anti-pattern is also a very powerful concept. Ultimately, it's a worse practice where you can learn from other people's mistakes. If you think about from human experience, we often learn from our mistakes. That's probably the best way to learn. And unfortunately, in computing and software development, making too many mistakes is a rather costly exercise. So the good thing about an anti-pattern, if it's somebody else has made a mistake, hopefully they will document that mistake in particular, in our case, an ADF architectural pattern or anti-pattern, and then communicate that to the rest of us so we can learn from those mistakes without making the same mistake ourselves. With the fine-grained architecture pattern or anti-pattern in mind, I must admit, hand in my heart, hand in the air, that I was responsible for implementing this anti-pattern at a previous customer site before joining Oracle. Luckily, we realized our mistake. I had quite a sturdy manager above me who realized that oh, this wasn't going to work at some stage, and we corrected this and went with a different, anti uh, a different pattern, I should say, that has actually been articulated in the previous episodes. But the thing about the fine grain pattern is it's really driven by a user requirement and the reusable side of the ADF framework. We had a requirement from the managers that we were going to build an internal and external consumer and staff facing systems, and there should be a lot of reuse across them. Now we couldn't tell the level of reuse, so we kind of came up with a model that said, well, if we don't know the level of reuse, then we better make everything reusable. So what we did is we broke every page down into multiple regions, which Banner Tarslow supports through page fragments, and each one of those became a single BTF view activity. Then we just reconstituted them in a wrapping BTF, and we knew then if later on the second application come along, comes along and wants one of those little bits of the screen, we wouldn't have to snip bits out of a larger BTF. We could just grab these really fine-grained BTFs with one view activity and reuse them. 
Now the interesting thing about this pattern is, yes, your developers have to follow this concept of reuse religiously. They need to understand that they've got to develop things at a very fine grain level, but so does the business. I mean, the business drives the requirements, but flip side is the business needs to understand when you start finally building that second application that if they've got a view object and a little page fragment over on this application in a bounded task flow they want to reuse, they can't start coming along and saying the second application, but we want to change it. It needs to be reordered. And that causes you to actually start building a second BTF with a different view activity. This other concept of reuse needs to be something that the whole organization is comfortable with. So let's try and explain that diagrammatically so you get an idea where we're coming from. What we have here is a screenshot from Oracle's Fusion applications. Now you've probably seen or listened to a number of marketing exercises from Oracle salesmen on Fusion applications. Ultimately it's the contemporary e-business suite and what's quite interesting about it from an ADF perspective is it's all written in ADF. Basically ADF is the main building block of the Fusion applications. Now in addressing this particular Fusion application screen here, I must admit I have no real idea what module it comes from, though if you're a Fusion Apps person you'd probably be able to tell straight away, but it's obviously something to do with customers, okay? And what we're going to do is use this for a basis of explaining the fine-grained architecture. So ignoring the lovely Skyrus skin, the lovely black and blues, the menuing system on the left-hand side, what you can notice is in the main part of the page that we have something to do with customers. And by the way the page is laid out and the various headings, you can probably see the various logical blocks such as edit customer, basic information, customer details, and so on and so forth down the page. Now if you consider each one of those, okay, each one of those from an ADF perspective and the fine-grained architecture perspective, rather than having one overall page fragment to contain all those logical blocks, each one of those is in fact going to become a BTF in its own right. So about a task load based on a page fragment with likely just one view activity. And if you have a look down this particular page, that means we're going to end up with a whole bunch of bounded task flows. Now what's interesting is we can probably say these are all sorts of service bounded task flows, but ultimately <clears throat> that one little page now has five BTFs aligned with it. Now in order to publish that page, you can't just go and sort of join or glue all those bounded task flows in the regions together. You need a composite BTF in order to do that. So very quickly, what we can see with this fine grain architecture, though we could reuse those service BTFs across lots of different applications, what we see is building at this level of architecture really multiplies the amount of bounded task flows we've got. This one little page, Without even considering the menuing systems and all the borders, we're already up to six bounded task flows. Now, multiply that from a maintenance perspective. Uh, you're going to have for maybe a 20 page application, a 50 page, 100 page application, 600 bounded task flows at minimum that you're going to be tracking, assuming that each page has that many average bounded task flows. What a nightmare this is going to become. Now, if you look back at this page, mm, you can start to wonder, hang on, are we really going to reuse all these bounded task flows? Now, customers is a good example because we're likely to use that basic information header again and the customer details, maybe addresses, but customer types. Hmm, are we really going to reuse that elsewhere? Do we really need to build everything to be reusable? And this is where the fine grain pattern sort of falls down because we think we're going to reuse everything everywhere, but what happens if we only use maybe two out of those seven as reusable bounded task flows? We've really gone to this lot of level, a lot of uh, work for a reuse, but we're not actually going to make use of it. So the advantages of the fine grain architectural pattern is, well, it's kind of like an extreme sport. If you love pain, this particular pattern is for you because, hey, you really do get like a nirvana of reuse occurring. Everything is built with reuse in mind and you will start to see reuse coming through in all sorts of parts of your application development. But from the disadvantage perspective, oh boy, will you start to see that maintaining these multitudes of bounded task flows and keeping them consistent because the way you have to make them reusable, you need typically standard APIs and parameters and how they're laid out and so on and so forth. 
it becomes a big, huge overhead. And particularly because most of the banner title layers you'll find in the end won't be reused. So you're going for this ultimate house of cards reuse where only a couple of the cards actually need to be reused. The rest of them, well, they're just there because you thought reuse was a cool thing. So the fine grained architecture pattern potentially takes the concepts of reuse too far. And what I'm not saying here is that potentially you will have BTS with just one view activity. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have those, but to have that across your whole application is possibly just taking this concept to reuse so far that it causes you massive maintenance and build nightmares. So you've got to kind of come up with a nice balance between reuse and not reuse, okay, or non-reusable applications. And where the fine line is, well, that's hard to say. But at least from this architectural pattern, you get an idea of how you can take things too far. So that wraps up after numerous episodes, the ADF architecture patterns. We've looked at, I guess, seven or eight different patterns over the life of this subset of episodes. And I hope it's given you a good insight into the different ways that you can orchestrate, architect, and design your ADF applications. So from here on in, we're going to move beyond the concepts of ADF architecture patterns, and we're going to start looking at some more advanced options in banner task layers, such as the transaction, data control scope options, and even answer the ultimate question, how many application modules should your application have? So thanks for joining us in this episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel. I hope this set of episodes has been valuable to you, and we look forward to having you in the next episode very soon.